We're going to be in Mark chapter 16. There for a minute or two, I thought Scott was going to steal my entire message. That would have been okay. That would have meant you needed to hear it twice, and I'm okay with that. You know, just a few short days ago, we talked about crucifixion. We talked about what that entailed and what that meant. We discussed the fact that while the crucifixion was necessary, we also talked about that not being the end of the story. And so today is a very special day for us. This weekend, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches from all over the world will be celebrating the glorious resurrection of our Lord, which is the very foundation of our Christian faith and our Christian walk. You know, I think back to Christmas. Y'all remember I love Christmas. So when it comes to preparing for the Christmas series that we normally do, um, I normally start right around June. And I'll start pulling notes, and I'll start looking at things, and I'll go here and I'll go there. You know what part of that is, Clay? Part of that is Christmas carols going on in the office in June. Now, do you know that June's kind of warm? Typically, it's Michigan. It could go either way. And so very often in the month of June, I have my windows open. Did I mention that I play Christmas carols? And I don't have them playing softly. More than once, I have seen people walk by going, I'm used to that. It was a very glorious day when Christ was born. The Messiah had come to the world. You know, the very glory of God veiled in human flesh. Without the virgin birth of Christ, we would have no hope, and the resurrection would certainly be in vain. It would not have been to us what it has been had it not been for the sacrifice, the substitutionary atonement, we would still be in our sin. There would be no change. There would be no reason for us to pass from death to life. We would not be new creations in Jesus Christ. Had it not been for his victory over death, over hell, over the grave, the resurrection would really offer no hope of eternal life. And so really it is the foundation of what we believe. And so today uh, we celebrate the fulfillment of the promises of God and the promises that Christ gave when he said, I'm going to die, but I am not going to stay dead. I am going to rise. Okay, so remember the disciples at this point. Uh, the disciples are hearing this. They're in the upper room, right? And, and Christ has been ministering to them. They have been walking side by side with him for three years. Uh, Christ says, I'm going to die. And they go through the whole uh, discourse in the upper room. The disciples didn't fully understand and get it, did they? And you know what? As much as they didn't get the crucifixion, they didn't get resurrection either. Do you know why? That doesn't happen. You do not see that happening. And so here are the disciples up in the upper room, and they are filled with dread and despair. The crucifixion comes. They are filled with fear. They are filled with apprehension. They are afraid. Resurrection comes. And all of a sudden, that fear and that dread gives way to rejoicing and gives way to hope. And so this morning, we want to take a few minutes and look at the tomb, look at the borrowed tomb where Jesus' dead body was laid. And 
The fact that it, his body was dead is very important. We talked about that just a few days ago. I want us to turn our hearts from that fear and that dread to a day of triumph, a day of rejoicing. Because really, that's what we're supposed to do today. In uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, I want to I want to read it, and then we're going to tear it apart here just for a little bit. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Verse 4 says, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed, and he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek a Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Verse 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So we look at a couple of things here within uh, these few verses here. Uh, the first thing is this. This was a morning of obscurity. This was a morning that really we need to understand the context of what has happened. The events of the last few days have left them very confused, very anxious, numb. Their faith had been tested. And you know what? They were asking the questions that begin with why. They were searching for so many answers. Things did not go according to their plan. Things did not happen as they thought they would. But yet here are some women who really give us just a wonderful picture of what resurrection is and what it means the first thing we want to look at is their pain. Verse 1, the Sabbath was passed. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought, sprite, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Keep in mind that these women had a relationship with Christ. They believed who he said he was. They believed he was the Messiah. They had heard the words of the Lord. They had witnessed the miracles. They had seen them. And yet this very man who did all of these things was taken away. He was crucified and he was buried. And to them it would seem that their hopes had been buried with him. The one in whom they had placed, their trust had been taken away. 33 years old. That's young. That's young. The Romans were still in power. They were in jeopardy because of their faith. They were just trying to stay alive at this point. They have come to do all that they feel is left to do, and that is to anoint his body and to provide a means of honor and respect for the one that they loved so dearly. You see a picture of the pain in their heart. What can we do at this point? This is what we can do. In verse 2, it says this. Very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. It shows their passion. It shows their passion. They were committed to doing 
all that they could do to ensure a proper burial for one who had been so abused and neglected. Do you realize at crucifixion, very often burials did not take place? Very often, the bodies were thrown outside of the city to rot, to become food for scavengers. Very often, you did not see this. And yet, here they are. doing the very thing that they knew they must do. Do you wonder if they were concerned about their safety? I mean, these were crowds that had cried crucify him. This was a big deal. There was a lot going on here. And of course, the thoughts of Jesus on the cross, never far away from their minds really showed their passion. It showed their compassion for the one whom they loved. Acts 20, verse 24 says this, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. We're reminded of the sacrifice of Christ. We're reminded of the passion of these women who came to do what they could do. It speaks of a commitment to their Lord. In verse 3, we find their perspective. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? As the women are making their way to the tomb, they're concerned with their physical limitations. Do you remember what scripture said? This wasn't just a little stone. This was a big stone. They were focused on how to get the stone rolled away, and they weren't focused on the fact that Christ said he would rise. They had not come expecting to see that the Lord had risen. How do we know that? They came with spices to anoint his body. It can be very easy for us to look back and to wonder how their hearts could have been filled with such unbelief. I mean, they had walked with him. They had heard him speak. They had been witness to so many miracles. But yet here they are. They are discouraged and doubtful. But lest we think any less of them, I put myself in their place and chances are I would feel the exact same way. I've done enough funerals to know. And Harold, I'm sure you're with me. And, and Pastor Scott has done uh, several funerals, never easy uh, services to do. Not once have I seen anybody rise from the dead. When you see that, the funeral's over. I've never seen that. And they hadn't either up till this point. They had experienced great loss. And they went there with the purpose to anoint his body, not realizing or even comprehending the fact that when resurrection happens, the funeral is done. The funeral is over. Very often that a funeral for a friend or loved one, you will have all gamuts of emotion that come into play. I can remember when mom passed away here last year, I can remember there being tears. I can remember there being laughter. 
pretty soon, I think it was more laughter than anything, as we recalled the memories of mom and, and what she would do, what she would say. Mom always said, I took after dad, to which dad would go, you took after mom. All gamuts of emotion. Here we have all kinds of emotion that we see that is present here. But remember what I said, when resurrection happens, the funeral is over. The dread, the fear, the fright, the discouragement, the despair, very shortly will fade away from view. We must place our confidence in the risen Lord. That is where our confidence belongs. He came out of the grave. He came out of the grave. Okay, good. Making sure you're awake. And because of that, the second point is this. It is a message, not of defeat, but it is a message of victory. The women came with doubt and despair. It was turned into victory. As they came to the tomb, things were very different. Rather than seeing a cold, dead body, there was an angel who gave them a message of victory. A message of victory. What did this angel say? Well, he spoke comfort to them. We know that. He said to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. They made their way with hearts of fear. They were unsure of what the future would bring. They come to the tomb. The angel speaks words of comfort. And he says this, don't be alarmed. Now that word alarmed means to be excited or to be amazed. And can I say, excitement can go either way, right? You can be excited. Woohoo! something, happy, happy. And we all love excitement like that, don't we? We just love that. Excitement also happens in times of tragedy when, quite honestly, um, we don't know what to think. We don't know how to express ourselves. And excitement uh, can come about in different ways. And the angel says, do not be excited or amazed. We want you to be comforted by this. Where's the comfort found? His body isn't here. He's risen. <laughs> and then the angel, as if to put an exclamation point on it, says, <laughs> he's not here. Words of comfort. Words of encouragement. We also know that he spoke words of confidence. Again, in verse 6, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's risen. See the place where they laid him. They had come to anoint the body of Christ. They had come for the Savior. He wanted them to know that their search was not in vain. Their faith in Christ was not in vain. The Lord was all they believed and so much more, and he wanted to reassure him or them in the Lord. Jesus had died, but you know what? He did not stay dead. Hope had not ended there in the tomb. Now, the reality today is that we live in a world where many do not believe the gospel. They claim that our faith is in vain, that we believe in something that is a myth, something that doesn't exist. You know what, out of this, my prayer is this, is that once again, we would be comforted and we would be reassured that we serve a risen Savior who is in the world today. We also know that he spoke words of conquest 
We see this also in verse 6. The women came expecting a lifeless body. They wanted to make the final preparations for his burial. The angel proclaims the words. He is not here. Jesus is no longer in the tomb. Jesus has risen victoriously from the grave. Why? There wasn't anything there to hold him. We need to be thankful for a risen Savior. We need to be thankful for an empty tomb. We need to be thankful that death could not hold our Lord. We have the hope of eternal life, forgiveness of sin, the glories of heaven that await us as his children because of that very tomb that is empty today. There is hope in these words. Cemeteries are filled with the bodies of our friends and our loved ones. Their bodies lie waiting on the shout to come forth. Boy, that's going to be a sight to see. One glorious day, all the dead in Christ will rise. The graves will burst forth in victory. Why will that happen? Because Christ rose from the grave. That's going to be a great reunion. That is going to be something that we will rejoice in. And can I say, get an early start. Don't wait till then to rejoice. Rejoice now. Because we can do that. We will be resurrected and we will have a glorious body. We will be free of pain. Tasha, no wheelchair. I would take my glasses off as an illustration and throw them. I wouldn't be able to find them. You know what? The challenges, the physical limitations that we have here on earth will fade away as we are resurrected with glorified bodies. All because of the resurrection. He also spoke words of celebration. Words of celebration, verses 7 and 8. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, I'll underline this, just as he told you. That's important. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. What a change! in the hearts of the women that were there. They had come with little hope. They left with the promise that Jesus lives. They had received the news that Jesus had risen. You know what? I love the story of Lazarus, don't you? All right, so, so Lazarus gets sick, and what happens? He dies. And they come to Jesus and they say, hey, uh, you know what? If you would have been here, Lazarus, uh, uh, he wouldn't have died. What did Jesus do? Raised him from the dead. You know what's wrong with that picture? Can you imagine dying twice? Kind of hard to fathom. I don't even know what the etiquette would be for a funeral like that. I have no idea. Lazarus was resurrected. He died again. Jesus was resurrected. He's not dying anymore. They received the news that Jesus had risen and lives. Much of what we hear today, and Scott said rightly, if we put our faith and our trust in the news, printed or otherwise, if we put our faith in the news, we will be sorely disappointed. Why? Because there's little comfort to be found there. 
We're bombarded with news of death and destruction, news of despair. But can I say this for the redeemed? We can rejoice in the good news that our Savior lives. And if you can't think of anything to be thankful for, can I say praise God for that? Praise him for that. The women were given the promise of seeing Jesus again. And you know, I can't help but think how they were looking forward to that. We here, we have never seen the Lord. But can I say, one day we will. One day we will. We are promised that Jesus will return for his bride, his church. What's the definition of the church? Is it only us? All of his people who have been redeemed, he is coming again. You know, we echo the Apostle Paul, we have not seen him, but yet we love him. And our love will be shown in the devotion that we give as we serve him faithfully until Christ returns. I love times of resurrection. I love this time of year when we take the time and we think of the cross on which Jesus died for us. And our hearts are filled with sorrow, knowing full well that should have been us. And we look at the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross for us, and all we can do is say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then we look at an empty tomb, and that's why we can sing songs, Trish, like he reigns. She sent that to me earlier in the week. I played it about 10 times. I had the windows open, and it was loud. That's why we can sing songs like, Because He Lives. That's why we can sing songs like, Victory in Jesus. Because we have that victory. Loving Father God, we are thankful for your word. Father, we are thankful that Christ came to seek and to save those who are lost. That was us at one time. Father, there may be somebody here that describes them to a T. That describes them perfectly. Father, I pray that if there is one that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Father, that today would be the day of salvation. Father, that their hope would not be found in the things of this earth, but rather in the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. Father, we thank you for resurrection. Father, we thank you that we are called each and every day to remember and to reflect on what that means and to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to a fallen and broken world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.